In the last part, I want to say a few words about the biological motivation of convolutional neural networks. So in the 1950s and 60s, there was pioneering, pioneering work by neuroscientists Hubel and Wiesel on the visual cortex in cats. So with their experiments, they discovered the basic functionality of how the vision system in mammals works and they recorded the activity of individual neurons in cats by showing them particular images or shapes. And they found that there are neurons in the early visual system that specifically respond to certain patterns of light, for example, precisely oriented bars, like horizontal or vertical bars. Hubel and Wiesel specifically studied the primary visual cortex, so V1, which is the first brain area which performs some advanced processing of the visual input coming from the eye. And this is giving a lot of inspiration to convolutional neural networks. So V1 is, for example, arranged in a two-dimensional spatial map, which really mirrors the image in the retina of the eye, inspiring the 2D structure of convolutional neural networks. There are so-called simple cells, so specific brain cells in V1, which respond approximately linear to a small spatially localized receptive field. So, for example, particular features or patterns in the image. And this inspires the convolutional neural network detector units. And most of these V1 simple cells really seem to recognize features or patterns that are described by GABOR functions. GABOR functions are these functions here. So this is a mathematical family of functions, but you can see if you look at the different members of the family that these are really filter detectors that are basically detecting edges in different orientations. And this is also what you typically find in convolutional neural networks when you train them on image classification tasks, for example, that the filters or kernels found in the first layer end up to be quite a lot like the upper functions, or at least many of them. There are also so-called complex cells in uh, the primary visual cortex, and they respond to features as simple cells, but they're invariant to small position shifts, so they kind of integrate multiple inputs and uh, they introduce some invariant. So this inspires the pooling units that you have in convolutional neural networks. There is an assumption and to some degree knowledge that the basic strategy of detecting and pooling is also repeated in deeper brain layers. Although the human brain or mammalian brains are definitely not deep compared to current deep artificial neural networks. There's been a lot of discussion about concepts such as grandmother cells, and there is some evidence for those. So the idea of a grandmother cell is, let's say if you see your grandmother or a picture of her, then there is a neuron which activates in order to basically detect, ah, this is my grandmother. So it's like a feature detector neuron. So of course, there's not only one network that activates, but there's the idea that there are these conceptual object detectors. And this is not necessarily restricted to images, so there's also the idea that there are neurons that are activated by certain concepts, either by seeing a photo of a person or by uh, reading the name of that person. So there's this idea of the Hale-Berry neuron, which is activated by Hale-Berry. So you see neuroscientists and, and machine learners have a lot of time to think about exotic examples. The relevance of this, these ideas of having individual neurons for specific concepts, high-level concepts, is not really very clear. So there is some evidence for that, but there is also evidence for, for the fact that complex uh, uh, objects or concepts are uh, delocally de stored. There are some important differences about mammalian vision and convolution neural networks that we use in the computer. So one difference is, for example, the human eye is mostly low resolution except for a tiny patch, which uh, is a small, uh, a, a small location around the so-called vovea or the yellow spot. 
And so really the part of an image that you see actually with a high resolution is the size of a thumbnail if you hold your thumb uh, arm's length away from you. The idea or the perception that you see an entire scene in high resolution is really an is illusion that is stitched together from glimpses of many small area and, and your, your eyes are moving around and patching this image together. However, recently in artificial neural networks there's an important concept that has come up that's called attention mechanism. And that is getting close to this idea. So attention mechanism is the idea that you have um, um, a set of inputs or a sequence of inputs and you learn to focus on certain parts of them in order to do your processing. Also an important difference, of course, the human visual system is integrated with many other senses, such as hearing, smell, other factors like moods and thoughts, etc. Also the, the language processing units in the brain are quite closely connected with the visual parts. So when you read or hear a certain concept, your visual cortex generates an image of that object or concept and vice versa. You see something and you think of the name of the object. These deep connections are quite complex connections between different brain functions have not been very much explored in artificial neural networks. And of course the human visual system does much more than just recognizing objects. It's able to understand scenes and relate objects in the scene to each other, both spatially as well as logically or functionally. There is an interesting idea called capsule networks that make the spatial location and the transformation between different spatial locations more explicit. So have a look at that. And although the first parts of the visual cortex is quite feed forward, it's not only feed forward. So all areas, also V1, are heavily impacted by feedback from higher levels. And of course brain cells are really much more complicated and diverse than artificial neurons are. So with that I want to end this part. Neuroscience and the relationships between neuroscience and machine learning or artificial neural networks are really fascinating and I can really motivate you to look into that a little more and try to read about how memory works, how our vision works, what, what we know about that at least. This is also a very interesting and, and quickly expanding field and I believe a lot of interesting ideas uh, um, and concepts can be learned from neuroscience that might be useful in artificial neural networks as well. Although it is of course very difficult to implement a com completely new architecture that was obtained from a biological idea and then hope that you can beat some some standard data benchmark that many other people have worked on with standard efficiently implemented algorithms. But it's not all about benchmarks. Machine learning is very much driven by benchmarks but I think in order to really make progress in the long run we also need new concepts and creative new concepts that are based on completely different ideas. So feel free to, to read about this biological background and, and and see if you can get some completely new ideas and try them out. The good thing is that with uh, the programming languages that we also use in order to build artificial neural networks such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, etc. We have really powerful tools to encode also completely new ideas. With that, thank you for the attention and see you in the next lecture.